Today on the Everything 80s Podcast, the story of the most important 80s group you've never heard of, the Memphis Group. Hey there, what's happening? Welcome back to the Everything 80s Podcast. I'm Jamie. Thanks for coming on out today. And if it wasn't for the Memphis Group, the 80s as you recognize it may never have happened. The Memphis Group was an art collective formed in Milan in 1980 by Tor Sotsis and would be a major influence on the world of art and design. They would go on to create the Memphis design, which gave us the 1980s aesthetic. And that's what we're going to look at here today. Before we start, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe wherever you find your podcasts. I've got a whole bunch of amazing shows on every 80s topic you could ever think of. Um, so whether it's uh Google Play, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you find your podcasts, wherever you like to listen to them, I should be there. Okay, here we go. So every decade has a certain aesthetic that defines that era. For the 1980s, you can probably picture that bright pop aesthetic right now. Just think of the Say by the Bell opening logo uh, or any of the binders and the folders you probably had in your backpack. You just even have to look at the art a design for this show. Just look at the logo art. That's the Memphis design. So this is a look back on the Memphis group and how they defined the look and the style of the 80s with what they called Memphis design. So who started the Memphis group? I just mentioned that the focus of the whole group was about the Italian cool movement. Um, and it was started by Ettore Satsas, which I've had trouble saying, but that's what I'm going with. So he always described himself as a rebel with a cause. He was born on September 14th, 1917. Though he was born in Austria, Satsas would grow up in Turin, Italy, and was a son of an architect. This would influence him as far as style and design. He would end up studying architecture himself and graduate in 1939 from uh, one of the universities in Torino. His first involvement with artistic groups was when he became a member of the Movimento Italiano per l'Architecture Rationale, which is as best Italian you're possibly going to get out of me. Um, easier to call that as the M-I-A-R. This was a modernist architecture group, and he would also work alongside his father. So Sotsas and his father looked to create modernist versions of buildings that would change the aesthetic of where they were located. This was after World War II, so many buildings needed to be created after being previously destroyed or damaged beyond recognition. So let's look at his early career. He would break free from his father and set up his very own architectural studio, where he would also focus on industrial design. It was at this point he started to look beyond just architecture and how he could lend his design to many different mediums, including ceramics and sculptures and painting and photography and jewelry and furniture and interior design. Those last two would be really important for the growth of the Memphis design itself. He also looked beyond just his home country of Italy and moved to New York in 1956. He worked for American industrial designer George Nelson, who had him traveling all over with different projects and assignments. It was also in 1956 where Sotsis would have some of his work commissioned into a ceramics exhibition. Sotsis would eventually return home to Italy and started working with furniture companies as an artistic consultant. He had a unique approach that would also be a radical shift in something as simple as furniture design. It was while working as the artistic consultant that he started to put in place the design aesthetics that would influence the Memphis design. So now he starts to expand his career. Before the formation of the Memphis Group, Sotsis would work for a famous Italian entrepreneur and politician, Andriano Olivetti. Olivetti hired Sotsis as a design consultant as he liked the fresh and radical approach he saw in his work. Olivetti and Sotsis designs, um, he looked into sort of just changing the dynamic and mood of where he lived and where he worked in his offices. And he had Sasa design all those environments. He sort of gave him free range to create whatever look and design and um, color and furniture style, even the objects within the office. He had sort of free reign to um, create whatever he wanted. Sotsis would design mechanical objects like computers and typewriters. And this is really where he started to make his name as a unique designer. If you go on um, 
everything80spodcast.com slash the Memphis group. You can see more of these images and stuff, but if you Google image Memphis design, you'll see what I'm talking about. You probably already have an idea in your head, but just to get, you know, get more up to speed with what we're looking at here. So he's, you know, making his name and he's getting a little more well known and uh, people are seeing that he's sort of thinking outside the box here. He was really creating the first pop consumer objects that made regular items trendy in the same way Steve Jobs would with Apple or think, um, you know, how, you know, the iPod became sort of a style statement as much as it was this amazing device. Jobs took this similar approach, thinking that something bland and mechanical like a computer could actually be a piece of art and even a statement. The original Macintosh had this same design concept behind it. It was, you know, meant to look good in your home, not just be this industrial mechanical thing. Sotsis was being unconventional with his use of colors and styling and even the forms he was using to transform everyday objects into a piece of art, yet still being fully functional. Again, part of the core of uh, Apple. He was also using some of the colors and designs that would be part of the Memphis group and that would eventually become the famous Memphis design. Due to the success of the work he was doing, all of that he offered Sotsis a job as a full-time designer along with a massive salary. Sotsa saw this as settling and didn't want to prevent himself from continuing to grow. He didn't want to be held back um, from expanding and evolving his work, so he declined the offer. He was ready to branch out on his own. And this leads us more uh, into the era of the Memphis group and the early formation of them. So we're going into the late 60s and the early 70s, and a lot of artistic groups are starting to pop up. They were collectives of like, you know, collectives of like-minded people who were interested in creating artistic movements. These collectives would all have the same goal of trying to influence the culture with their specific take on design and style. And every era has sort of its specific aesthetics. If you think of the 60s and sort of that, you know, flower power look and the 70s more maybe you might think of like earth tones and browns and, and colors like that. And, you know, it's these collective art groups that give each decade and era its look. So in 1980, Sotsis founded the Memphis Group with the similar intent of changing the world of architecture, furniture, and overall design. Little did they know it would be a whole pop culture overhaul. They were just looking for functional usage of this new art, you know, just so your table looked new and good and it would stand out from the old style ones or that your the chair you were selecting for your new home you would want to go with uh, a Sotsis design over a bland run-of-the-mill other chair. Um, I mean, kind of think sort of what like Ikea is doing, where sometimes some of the pieces will stand out, and then a lot of them are very, again, like industrial. He's just wanting to break away from that mold. So he started the group on December 1st, 1980, when he first met with a various bunch of designers and artists, but it wasn't officially called the Memphis Group until 1981. And if you're thinking where the name Memphis come from, comes from, it has nothing to do with the city, but instead comes from a Bob Dylan song. Um, it was during their first meeting, they had Dylan stuck inside of Mobile with the Memphis Blues again, and the name Memphis stood out and was used to name the group. Bob Dylan is really big behind these artistic movements, and uh, not only his own movement, but if you have you know familiar with Steve Jobs and learn about his history, uh, Dylan was a massive influence in everything art and creative, and it was... Um, no, no spoiler alert, I don't think Steve Jobs was always the nicest human being in the world and treated a lot of people like garbage. Read his bi biography by Walter Isaacson. It's it's awesome. I read that book like every year. But he, there was one person he revered above anyone, almost to like a godlike status, and it was Bob Dylan. So the influence of Bob Dylan is is cannot be understated. All of the artists and designers that had met to eventually form the Memphis Group shared similar backgrounds and artistic interests. They were big fans of the Art Deco movement, which had first appeared in France shortly before the First World War started. You can see this Art Deco style reflected in many objects, buildings, art, jewelry, even vehicles at the time. Again, this is something, you know, if you're online or if you have your phone, whatever you're listening to, um, if you can open up your browser, a separate tab, just, and, and, and Google image some of these things, what, talking about like art deco movements and, and stuff like that, just to kind of see an example and how styles have evolved over time. 
I'd say in, if you can't see anything right now, or if you don't have access, a perfect example of Art Deco uh, reflected in architecture is the Chrysler Building in New York. So if you have that in mind, that's that's Art Deco, sort of that um, roaring 20s, 30s style um, artistic look. The members of the Memphis group were also influenced by pop art. This is the specific art style from the 1950s that was seen through the United States and Britain. So pop art was all about the very kitschy and unique. And hopefully, again, you have an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, it, it's got that very comic book-like look to it. Uh, it's all about including imagery from pop culture. Um, you would see a lot of pop art used in many advertisements in the 1950s. And, you know, maybe picture Andy Warhol and, you know, sort of that look there. So let's look at the evolution of the Memphis group. The goal of this group and Sotsis himself was to be innovators while still being provocative and maybe a bit controversial. I mean, art's a hard thing because you want to stand out and make a difference, but you still have to pay the bills and you want to leave a legacy. And I think at the end of the day, their goal was more to be the innovators. Um, you know, if they had to be provocative and controversial to do that, they would. But ultimately, it was the art that would come through. The group really transcended every type of practice and explored their own curiosities to create art and to create design. A big movement for the Memphis group was their postmodernist furniture design that started to capture the attention of the world. Again, I'm not sure how old you are, but uh, depending where you grew up or where, like when and your age, and you might have been exposed to this and you might have seen a little of this um, starting to creep into the culture. It's interesting, though, like when you look at the evolution of style and design, not that I know anything about that, but each decade is, is much a representation of the design of the past. So like if you're looking at, you know, houses and, and stuff and, and designs and color schemes and say 1982 or 1981, unless you're really up to date and you have all the money for renovations and to redecorate, the styles are as much about the 70s. Um, going into the 80s you know same thing with like the style of the early 90s is as much an influence of the late 1980s so the, the decades always sort of spill over a bit and it was <clears throat> kind of the same thing with this you know they're trying to take this um, new style that's kind of combined different eras you know like the 1920s and the 1950s and they're trying to make it um, you know represent an entire new decade and that's why, you know, you wouldn't see this style maybe until later. And so sometimes a lot of the imagery and the uh, architecture and if you looked at like modern homes and stuff like that, it's as much this style that would carry over later on. So the big thing is usually it was their postmodernist furniture design. And that was the combination, again, the 50s Art Deco pop art and the furniture they're creating, which was kind of their bread and butter in the early days, it looked like it was right out of a painting. When you look at some of these images, you, you kind of can't imagine that it was in houses. But like, again, for the people who were up to date on art and had the money and could renovate, they would start including all these pieces. And the pictures of the, like their living rooms didn't even look real. They, they almost looked like it was like this like clay designed, um, bright colored, uh, sort of taken out of a comic book almost. Um, the work was all, you know, weird color combinations and geometric shape patterns that would probably seem odd and bizarre to the regular person. However, this style, you know, caught the attention of a lot of people because it's coming out of this bland era where, you know, depending uh, for <laughs> my, uh, where I lived, our basement was the classic orange shag carpet with the fake wood wall paneling. And a lot of places had that. Again, that was sort of that 70s style, that earth tones and stuff like that. And this was just completely turning it on its head. So you're going from these maybe drab colors and this sort of bell bottom, you know, um, not necessarily plaid, but like, you know, brown corduroy pants and couches that matched all that sort of thing. And now you've got this just completely out there style, but that really uh, sort of captured the artistic community and musicians um, 
and celebrities, Andy Warhol was a big time um, influenced by this. David Bowie was influenced by it. So the first big showcase where they sort of display this to the world is in 1981 at the Salon de Mobile, which was a very important, very important furniture design fair held in Milan, Italy. They de- debuted many pieces at this, at this fair, but primarily it was the furniture again, which was the center point. They wanted to start with this kind of capture their audience and then they could expand off because now they had more clout and their name was out there. Every object they created was given the name of a famous hotel. So the pieces and the furniture would be called like the Bel Air, the Plaza Vanity, or the Sheraton. They were simply taking lower budget items and materials and putting them together in the bizarre fashion, but then giving them high-end names at the same time. So, I mean, art lovers and people just looking for the new thing are just like drooling over this stuff. But at the same time, it was confusing some people, but... Capturing, capturing their attention. There was um, interest whether you hated it or liked it. It was enthralling. Again, no matter what the reaction, there was still a reaction. And it led to this exhibition in 1981 being overrun with visitors. Everyone was clamoring to see this new art style that was being unveiled. And there were so many people swarming to get into the building that the Memphis group themselves on their way to the exhibit thought there had been a terrorist attack when they arrived at the show because that's so many people were outside. Okay, so the design is unleashed on the world, and it would be the look that would define the aesthetic of the 1980s, and because it's all about, Memphis design is all about being radical. It's a response, um, as I was saying about, you know, the 70s and the shag carpet and all that. It was a response to the bland, to the minimal, um, and the practical design that was created not only in modernism, but what it evolved to into the like, you know, into the seventies again. And you can see Memphis style as a punk rock version of art. If modernism was say like elevator music or big band music or something like that, it was um, going against it. Anytime there's this, these movements in pop culture, there's always the counterculture. There's always the reaction to it. That's what the Memphis design was. The Memphis design is all about these big, bold, and bright colors, bizarre shapes, and the mismatching styles. The colors clash, but everything pops. And it was a great way to represent the 1980s. After the success of the Milan Furniture Fair, the Memphis group started to see their influence spread around the world and then into pop culture. The group and their new style were starting to influence many other artists and designers who were having to embrace this new radical approach that was catching on like wildfire. You didn't want to be left behind. The spread of the Memphis style seemed to work perfectly with the advent of another new radical idea, music television, or MTV, obviously. An all-day music channel had never been seen before, and it was seen as uh, completely impractical. Who would watch music videos all day? What was a music video? But when MTV first debuted in 1981, they changed the way we consume music. And they really changed the way we consume pop culture itself. I have an entire episode all about the history of MTV, which I find very interesting. Hopefully you will too. You can go back. It's one of the earlier episodes. So it made perfect sense that when MTV first debuted, the Memphis design was used in their logo, uh, in the promotions and in the introduction. The first debut to the world of MTV, if you've ever seen this before, the very first uh, commercial before they went on the air, features uh, the man on the moon and uh, the MTV flag. And it had all those different shapes and patterns and colors and all that was brought forth by the Memphis group. Again, this is more of an interactive episode, so you might have to go on YouTube and check out that very first intro for uh, MTV. So let's look at how it continues to influence um, and create the look of the 1980s. The Memphis group now had created a full-on movement with the Memphis style, and it was everywhere, like absolutely everywhere in the mid-80s. A a good way to sort of picture all this um, in in pop culture is Pee Wee's Playhouse. That would really help further spread the awareness of the new style. And the show was the definition of the Memphis group and the design. The aesthetic of Pee Wee's Playhouse is perfect to get like sort of a snapshot of what this design is all about. Um, Pee Wee's Playhouse was all that radical design, that 1950s kitschy apparel and furniture. And it featured all the designs made famous by the Memphis group, and this had a big impact on kids and on the culture in general. You would start to see the Memphis design 
in the opening credits of, you know, like I said, shows like Save by the Bell. And many networks would have to incorporate it into their um, promos and their sort of commercials and bumpers and all that stuff. They had to use the clashing colors, the mix match shapes, the geometric features, the swirls. They didn't want to look out of touch. So everyone had to embrace the style. The, it was showing up everywhere. It was in clothing and posters, bed sheets, school binders, pencil cases, everywhere. So then what happened to the Memphis group? They were starting to slow down going to the late 80s. By 1988, it was pretty much done. But Sotsis had started to slowly remove himself earlier than that. While the Memphis design was creating the look and the aesthetic of the 80s, he was creating a design consultancy, which he called Sotsis Associati. This was all about being able to create architecture on a huge scale and be able to create designs for international agencies. The Memphis group was focused on smaller objects, furniture, and general art, but he wanted to take things in a grander direction. By 1985, he would leave the Memphis group to focus solely on his um, Sotsis Associati. The interesting thing about this um, agency is that they would be doing what Steve Jobs eventually would with Apple stores. Sotsis was creating the design and the look for the stores of Esprit, and he was creating a look and aesthetic that could only be associated with their brand instead of all the other cookie cutter stores and showrooms out there. And again, if you know more of your Apple history and about Steve Jobs, the detail that he took with the Apple stores is off the charts level. Um, You know, just the specific slate he wanted and the marble and the stuff that came from India and the lighting, like, those stores are essentially art pieces and there's so much detail. And again, this is something that came from Saltzis. Saltzis Associati still exists today. It's based out of London and Milan. Former members of the Memphis group still work with Saltzis Associati to continue the direction and philosophy that Saltzis started with this group. So I guess let's look at the legacy of everything to do with the Memphis group and the Memphis design. As big as the legacy was that he created, more people have become familiar with the Memphis group as opposed to Sotsas himself. Young designers are coming out of school and many of them are referencing Memphis as a major influence, but not many are referencing the man himself. The Memphis group and design was so massive that it seemed to eclipse that of its own founder and even the group. I mean, this, I guess, happens when you have a style that represents an entire era. He has left a massive legacy, and it's being shared by museums and exhibitions all around the world. Um, there was different um, events celebrating the style and him at the uh, Met in New York, and they would showcase all his work. Um, and there'd always be these tours of the exhibitions and everything like that. Sotsis himself would die on New Year's Eve 2007 at the age of 90. His influence on art was profound, and the Memphis group leaves a rich legacy behind as they were able, again, to define an entire era. And there's not that many eras to define, so the fact that they did is pretty monumental. Again, it's not often that a look can be representative of a specific period in time, but the Memphis group was able to create an aesthetic that is immediately identifiable as the glorious 1980s. So I'll finish it there. Hopefully you found this interesting. Again, if you want any more detail, just go to everything80spodcast.com slash the Memphis group um, just to see some more images. So I just wanted to finish with a little info on how you can support the show and get some bonus content while you're at it. So these days it's, this is an independently produced show. It's just me. It's a one man band here. And as great as podcasting is and how much it's grown has been awesome. It's also sort of tough to stand out because now the entire industry has really been taken over by companies, celebrities, huge podcast networks. Uh, So, you know, competing with that is difficult, but I use a platform called patreon.com and that's a way for people to support the show. And again, like I said, get bonus content while they're at it. So it's, you know, minimal type investment where it's a couple bucks a month and then there's different tiers and each tier comes with a different reward. So say in like my Boba Fett tier, that gets you access to the Everything 80s movie review show. So that's, you know, the best of the 1980s and the worst. Uh, just for Patreons. So if you want to learn more and just see the different tiers and everything like that, just go to patreon.com slash 80s, 80s. 
depending on what you're listening on, um, whatever podcast listener of your choice, wherever the show notes are, there'll be a link to it if you want to check that out more. But either way, I appreciate you taking the time to listen to the show. Again, there's so many podcasts out there, which is great. But, you know, the fact that you're listening to this one means a lot. So, you know, subscribe if you haven't. And I will be back soon with a new episode. Don't you dare miss it.